Okay, so I kind of stuck on this. You know, I know I did weather and I did, you know, I'm really got this, this theme uh, that's going on with the whole issue of the current creation and how it's going to be totally different than what, how, when God is revealed. And so when I say that, you know, the, the you know, revelation means the unveiling. You know, when you take a look at it, it's talking about the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And that unveiling is basically, you know, explaining who he is. And then when you get to basically the last chapter of the Bible, God comes down for the first time and is unveiled, you know, to humankind. So all of the stuff that we have on the planet right now and everything that happens allows for mystery. It allows for concealment. It allows for, you know, a shell game, you know? And so I like to kind of go into, you know, the, o the, the, the ocean's a mystery. You know, you can't look beneath the ocean when you look out over it. You can't see all the animals. You can't see what's happening. You know, the ocean covers two thirds of the earth, right? And just, so there's stuff that's hidden from us and concealed in the present creation. And, you know, same thing with how we talked about, you know, that the treasure's hidden, you know, and God unveils the treasure. and. He gives us understanding and he, he, uh, he basically does things in parables and then talks about what those parables are and that does reveals things. And the symbol of the clouds is the same thing. The symbol of the clouds and their special meaning in the Bible. Um, if you think about it, clouds have saved countless of lives during war, actually, because what pilots are taught to do is what, when they're being attacked is to find the clouds, you know, so they'll be hidden. Mm -hmm. And basically we have, even in military situations, one of the things that we've created uh, artificially in combat is what we call white phosphorus smoke. And white phosphorus smoke is a simulation of clouds. Is you throw smoke down, you put it when there's no cover, you put it on the ground and then run through it so the enemy can't shoot you. So anyway, we're going to look at God's communication through the clouds and what the scripture says about it. And when you actually do a study in the clouds, I think you'll find it very interesting. The clouds are his canopy, his hiding or his dwelling place. Go to Psalm 18.7. 7 through 15? Yeah. Okay. Then the earth shook and quaked, and the foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up out of his nostrils, and fire from his mouth was devouring. Coals burned from it. He, was all, uh, he also bowed the heavens down low and came down with thick darkness under his feet, he rode on a cherub and flew, and he sped on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, his canopy around him, darkness of waters, thick clouds. From the, bright, from the brightness before him passed his thick clouds, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens. The Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered them and lightning flashes in abundance and routed them. Then the channels of water appeared and the fountains of the world were exposed by your rebuke, Lord, at the blast of your breath of your nostrils. Here we have it. So you basically get this idea that, you know, that, you know, he made darkness his hiding place, his canopy around him, darkness of waters, thick clouds of the skies. Interesting. Go to Exodus 16. Mm -hmm. Um, go to verse, go, go do verse nine and 10. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, come forward before the Lord, for he has heard your grumblings. And it came about as Aaron spoke to the entire congregation of the sons of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel speak to them saying at twilight, you shall eat meat. And in the morning, you shall be filled with bread and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God. All right. So in this particular situation, and this happens throughout all of Exodus and Leviticus, tons and tons of times where the Lord comes down and the glory of the Lord appears in the cloud to shield his glory, obviously. Um, I think that's Psalm 104.3. I have PA. I don't know what the PA is. <laughs> Probably so, Psalm. Yeah. 
So Psalm 104.3. Uh, he lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks in the wings of the wind. Basically says that, you know, the clouds are like his, uh, you know, his car. That he's, you know, hangs out in the clouds, you know, when he's, uh, when he's, uh, I mean, he's concealing his glory in it, basically. Mm. And he, you know, this whole issue of his canopy, his hiding place is, you know, him staying in the clouds and having it be a place where he doesn't disclose himself. He got in Israel through the cloud. Go to Exodus 13, 21 through 22. Importance of the clouds. It says 13. 13, 21 through 22. And the Lord was going before them in a pillar of a cloud by day and led them the way and a pillar of fire by night to give them light so that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from the presence of the people. Okay. So he didn't, he, he did the fire, pillar of fire by night so they could see, but the, he didn't want them to see his glory during the day when he could see him. So he, whenever he led them, he it was always in a cloud the whole time. That's all they saw was a cloud. Look at Exodus 14, 19 through 20. Then the angel of God who had been going before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of the cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel and there was the cloud along the will along with the darkness yet it gave light at night. Therefore the one did not approach the other all night. All right, so there we have this whole issue of this cloud that's appearing again. And, uh, and then in verse 24, it says, uh, and at the morning watch, the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. So the Egyptians couldn't see him. Again, he was covered in the cloud. It kind of reminds me of Storm from X-Men and how she uses the weather to for their advantage like that too yes very much so and then exodus 24 15 then moses went up to the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain the glory of the lord rested on mount sinai and the cloud covered it for six days and the seventh day he called to moses from the midst of the cloud and to the eyes of the sons of israel the appearance of the glory of the lord was like a consuming fire on the mountain moses entered the midst of the cloud as he went up into the mountain and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Mm. So the importance of this cloud again, hiding God's glory, God hiding in the cloud, God, not, men not being able to stand before God's glory. And the only way God can shield it is to be in a cloud and to lead them. You know, the whole time he led them, all they saw was a cloud. The whole time. So the concealing of his glory because of the sin of the people. Um, a cloud hides his holiness and shields the people. Go to Exodus 40, verses 1 through 48. This is the best explanation of the tabernacle, actually, and what its purpose is and what God does with it. Just read the whole chapter. Go ahead, babe. Okay. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall place the ark of the testimony there, and you shall screen off the ark with the veil. Then you shall bring in the table and arrange what belongs on it. And you shall bring the lampstand and mount its lamps. You shall also set the gold altar of incense in front of the ark of testimony, set up the curtain for the doorway of the tabernacle, and you shall set the altar of burnt offering in front of the doorway of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. Then you shall set the basin between the tent of the meeting altar and put water in it. You shall also set up the courtyard all around the hang up the curtain for the gate of the courtyard. Then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and everything that is in it and consecrate it and all its furnishings, and it shall be holy. You shall also anoint the altar, uh, also anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar and the altar shall be most holy. And you shall anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate it. 
Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent meeting and wash them with water. And you shall put holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him so that he may serve as priest to me. You shall also bring his sons and put tunics on them and you shall anoint them just as you anointed their father so that, may they, that, so that they may serve as priest to me and their anointing will qualify them for the permanent priesthood throughout their generations. So Moses does these things according to all the Lord had commanded him, so he did. Now in the first month of the second year, the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. Moses erected the tabernacle, laid its bases, set up its boards, and inserted its bars, and erected its pillars. He spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent on top of it, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then he took the testimony, put it onto the ark, and attached the poles to the ark, and put the atoning cover on top of the ark. Then he brought the ark into the tabernacle, set up the veil for covering, and screened off the ark of testimony, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He then also put the tabernacle in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle, outside the veil. And he set the arrangement of bread and order on it before the Lord, just as the Lord had commanded on Moses. Then he placed the lampstand in the tent of meeting, opposite of the table, on the south side of the tabernacle. And he lighted up the lamps before the Lord, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then he placed the gold altar on the tent of the meeting in front of the veil. And he burned fragrant incense on it, and the Lord, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then he set up the curtain for the doorway of the tabernacle, and he set the altar of burnt offering in front of the doorway of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and offered it to the burnt offering and the meal offering, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. He placed the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar, and put water in it for washing. From it, Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and feet, and they entered the tent of meeting, and when they approached the altar, they washed, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And, the, and he erected the courtyard all around the tabernacle and the altar and hung up the curtain for the gate of the courtyard. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. The glory of the Lord, or settled on it and the glory of the Lord had filled the tabernacle. Throughout their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel was set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. So what's all this about? Just everything we read. What, what, what comes to mind with the preparation here? What is that about? I mean, is it all just... I, I mean... It seems to me that it's the sacrifice, all that is still, you know, just in prep for the ultimate sacrifice and all these different things because the temple was in one place and then it, when Christ came, there was no need for the temple. Well, did, and all of these shenanigans that basically that they had to do was not for the people to be holy. I mean, even Moses couldn't go into the tabernacle because he wasn't. Uh, it's for Aaron and his brothers. And all of that washing and the labor and the incense and all that stuff was all done because there was no bloodshed for, uh, uh, you know, on the people so that the body, so that the blood covered people so they could appear before God. That's what the blood of Christ did. Mm -hmm. So without the atonement of Christ, you have all of these shenanigans here and still the people can't view God in all of his glory because of the fact that Christ had not atoned for their, for their sin. Mm -hmm. So all of this purity has to be done and all of this cleaning and watering and, uh, you know, the garments and all the stuff in the temple. And then even so the cloud's still necessary, you know, and when they actually did the alt, when they actually did the sacrifice and God appeared before the priest, the incense created smoke. So the, so the priest could not look upon God. Yeah, but doesn't that also kind of describe the same sort of scene that's going on with heaven with our prayers also being the smoke for yeah. God? Yeah. Kind of yeah. represents the same scene in heaven as the temple that they're making on earth for him to dwell in. Well, there's actually uh, an incense, which is from the Old Testament standpoint, that's thrown upon the earth, which represents all the people's prayers prior to this that the angel throws upon the earth, which becomes a judgment, those prayers. <laughs> Very interesting. That's crazy. So clouds, when connected to a rainbow, becomes a sign of peace and remembrance. Go to Genesis chapter 9. I just read this. Verses 12 through 13. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> God said, this is the sign of the covenant, which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall serve as a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and every flesh and creature. 616, when the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every creature. And he keeps mentioning the, the, the bow in the, in, in, in the cloud. So keep in mind, when the people saw a cloud, that represented God. And so now when he puts the bow, the bow in it, in this beautiful rainbow, it represents a covenant between God and man. Uh, which basically is one of peace. It's one of the few times that clouds are not foreboding in the Bible. It actually becomes mm -hmm. a symbol of peace uh, between God and men, the bow and the cloud, which is actually a, 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 uh, a symbol of Jesus Christ, the rainbow. Wow. And that, the gay pride movement took it. Mm hmm yeah it is interesting isn't it okay so clouds also represent gloom and judgment go to exodus chapter 30. verse 3. you shall overlay it with pure gold its top and its sides all around and its horns and you shall make a gold molding all around for it you shall also make two gold rings for it under its molding, and you shall make them on its two sides, the opposite yeah, sides. Wrong passage, sorry. That's one of those Migliozzi uh, old man things. I think it's Ezekiel. Sorry. Ezekiel 30. Ezekiel 30. Yeah, yeah, this is, it says, um, for the day is near. Indeed, the day of the Lord is near. It will be the day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. Yeah. Right there, it's basically the only thing it really says that that's going to be there at doom is clouds. You know, it's very interesting. You, know, you also think that clouds also represent because they rep they block out the sun and the light, and so like the actual blocking out of the light is also that judgment. Well, also too, you know, when you look at something, you know, whenever you watch an evil show or a medieval book, what you know, what happens, uh, you know, that they have this foreboding storm with nimbus clouds, right? That mm -hmm. represent this evil aspect. Well, storms always represented as something that is trials and different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at Joel uh, chapter two, verses one through three. Blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming indeed. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as dawn is spread over the mountains. So there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it. To the years of many generations, a fire consumes before them and behind them. A flame devours. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but a desolate wilderness behind them, and nothing at all escapes them. Their appearance is like, oh, was I supposed to go? Keep going. That's fine. That's good. And then go to uh, Jesus will return in the clouds. Go to Matthew 24, verse 30, starting in verse uh, 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the son of man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So why does it say all the tribes of the earth will mourn? Uh, because the... Um... They will see Christ, and then they realize that they're not saved. So the that's, you said the there's only one true tribe. All the tribes of the earth represents all the people of the earth. 
Okay. And, but didn't you say that there's only one tribe? Judah. The tribe of Judah is the only tribe that's saved? No. Um, the tribe of Judah just represents the tribe of Jesus Christ. Um, of that, that, that line that Jesus Christ came out of was, was oh. Judah. Okay. But it's just more talking over generalized people when it yeah. says tribes. Generalized people. But, you know, whenever I look up at the sky and it's like no clouds, I'm like, okay, well, Jesus isn't coming today. <laughs> coming in the clouds. It's true. Dang. That doesn't really mean that. The clouds could just appear, you know. Just, <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's, it's more of the days where it's like, these clouds are not going away. <laughs> What's going on? But even though the clouds represent something of, you know, foreboding and concealment and judgment, uh, go to First First Thessalonians four seventeen. Wow, that's wow. I, this part I've never read. This I've never read that. Then we who are alive, who remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. But we're not going to, but when we actually spend time, when actually meet the Lord in the air, it's in the clouds, you know? So that whole concealment issue, you know, is there of that, of the clouds joining us with, with, with the sun. So the darkness that comes is just like an entire shroud of clouds that cover the entire earth. And we're just essentially raised right above the clouds so we're in like above where like the sun is shining but the whole earth essentially will be covered an entire thick darkness of clouds mm -hmm. essentially mm -hmm. mm. then i started focusing on the thunder of the lord i mean what's thunder how does thunder happen guys combustion in the air can it happen without clouds it's cloud combustion right Something yes like that. cloud combustion it's hot air with light air and the clouds cause the thunder. So, you know, it's a, it's without, without uh, clouds, you can't have thunder, thunder at all. So I see this 1919 mm. says uh, verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered with him with thunder. Mm. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. It basically just said God spoke to him totally with thunder, which means obviously that's happening because he's in the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. So the thunder comes out of the cloud. Look at Revelation 10, 1 through 11. Um, Ralph, what's the Greek word there for thunder? Is it, is, that, is it really thunder? Because there's also a translation here, a little thing that says, or a voice, a sound. No, it, it, it can be a sound. Like thunder. It, it can be. Well, well, let's just go, just to, just to show you that, go to John chapter 12. God's voice, especially sometimes when he doesn't want people to hear it, can also be thunder. Look at, look at John chapter 12, 12 verse 29. Hmm. I, I, I foresaw this question. Uh, so for, start at verse 27. Go all the way through 29. Now my soul has become troubled. And what am I to say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus responded and said, oh, this voice has not come for my sake, but for yours. Okay. And they couldn't hear it. Some people said it was an angel speaking, and some people said it, it thundered when they heard God's voice. Mm. Interesting. Um, so his voice is like a thunder that happens all through revelation. In this case, you don't even need to look at the Greek because they just said they heard God speak and they it, it thundered. That was just wow. thunder. Period. So do you think it's the people who are called can hear God's voice and everybody else can only hear thunder? Well, 
in this particular case, he said, this voice does not come for my sake, but for your sakes. So obviously the voice was intended for them. Yeah. Got to pay more attention to thunder. Yeah. Go to Revelation 10, 1 through 11. Keep going all the way to verse 11. I saw another strong angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. And a cloud. rainbow. Huh? He's clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was on his head. And his face was like the sun. And his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little scroll, which was open. And he placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven, pe uh, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from the heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heaven and the things on it, and the earth and the things on it, and the sea and the things on it, that there will no longer be a delay. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me, saying, Go, take the scroll which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and the land. And I went to the angel, telling him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but your mouth will be, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and I ate it. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey. But when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Okay, so he has to prophesy. And these things that were that were that are going to be sealed up or instead of being spoken became peals of thunder mm. just like when god was speaking they couldn't understand what was going on and it was interpreted as a peal of thunder so in this particular case the peals of thunder of all anybody anybody hears uh and then this message is going to get out before the end at the at verse 11 which is basically referring back to daniel 7 about the book that daniel couldn't open and read um which is interesting so again more mystery it's really interesting too that he said don't write this down whatever you hear yeah i wonder what he heard who knows i know right look at job 36 verses 27 through 33 talking about the thunder of the lord I'll just read it. For he draws up the drops of water, the distilled rain from the mist, which the clouds pour down, that drip upon man abundantly. Can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds, the thundering of his pavilion? Behold, he spreads his lightning about them, and he covers the depths of the sea. For by these he judges people, he gives food in abundance, he covers his hands with the lightning and commands it to strike of the mark. Its noise declares the presence, the cattle also concerning what is coming up. Verse 37, at this also my heart trembles and leaps from its place. Listen closely to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that goes down from his mouth. And under the whole heaven, he lets it loose and his lightning to the ends of the earth. And after it, a voice roars. He thunders with his majestic voice. And he does not restrain the lightning when his voice is heard. God thunders with his voice wondrously doing great things which we cannot comprehend. In other words, thundering is not something we can hear from the standpoint of his voice. It's to make us just stand still and go, wow. Why is that not part of like the, I guess the argument of like, right? Like science and atheism and stuff like, there it seems like their whole argument is that like we're all supposed to comprehend everything but then in the bible it says all the time that like it's uncomprehendable and like is it people's pride like they just really can't understand that there's things that we are not supposed to comprehend like we're right like we're really supposed to comprehend every single thing thunder is a part of the mystery thunder is one aspect of us not hearing what god is saying as you saw in John chapter 12, as are clouds. 
concealment, mystery, all of it. I like to just like stand there and just like you read one of these passages and like something thunders and you said, wow, did you hear what God just said? You're like, what? All you heard was thunder? You didn't hear what he said? Well, I can't tell you because it's it's supposed to be sealed up according to Revelation. We can't talk about the thunder. Sorry, but it was an amazing statement. <laughs> Very profound what was said. <laughs> So anyway, I just found this an interesting study because it's 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 culminating with everything I've been saying all along about the mystery and concealment and all that. That's just the way it is on the planet. While man is separated from God, God needs these dwelling places and clouds and all these things that make him distinct and thunder and all of this that separate. And I'm not talking about real thunder. Obviously, that's not God speaking. When the, these are specific revelations of thunder. Yeah. So really interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Clouds and thunder, and especially in the end times, how that plays such a big part. Yeah, it ends up being uh, how he presents himself in the end, and how he, how he, uh, in the end, um, it clouds represent judgment and the uh, judgment day. Jesus comes in the clouds, and then we meet him in the clouds. Isn't that all interesting? Like, so interesting. Yeah, clouds just have a very interesting impact on relation to the mystery and the bringing together of man and God uh, as they as they mingle together in the end. So I just find it fascinating stuff. Yeah. Well, he, he, I think um, I would love to also do. Um, could we also do a study on the waters? Okay. You missed it. Oh. You. We already did the one on the oceans. You weren't there. It's on the YouTube channel. I'll go watch it then did a whole thing on oceans and waters oh where was i you missed it where was i um but yeah no because i i recently saw like the the separation I knew you were say that the separation too. between the uh, water in the heavens and the water in the ocean and like where does that water dwell in the heavens and like space and all yeah, that we did that whole dang it's on all the right. youtube channel all right, i'll go watch it go watch it on youtube um in fact that water that's separated that's there's several atmospheres of water in genesis uh, and that that whole canopy collapsed at the flood. Yeah, because that that's also the reason why people were able to live to like be like nine hundred something years old with that canopy. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that canopy was, was extra great. oxygen. I love these studies yeah, so great. much. This is great. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad I'm glad you like them. I I found this fascinating too. In fact, yeah. uh, doing a word study in clouds just takes us. And there's so much more in there. If you just go into you know, all the roles that clouds play. I mean, I got everything. I got the gist of it, but all the places that clouds pop up in the Old Testament specifically is like everywhere. And God, you know, dealing with the clouds and being in the clouds and God, you know, and how God is revealed in the weather, in the rain, you know, in the, you know, in the lightning, in the thunder. He's right. Mm -hmm. in the yeah. Yeah. And it's just so sickening how the world it just takes everything away from God. It takes everything away from Christ. It takes all of his glory and all of his majesty and all of these incredible things that bring us so much wonder and amazement and just completely craps on them as if they don't right. exist. And like, it's just, for me, I feel like a constant, like righteous anger that like people just really don't care and they hate it and they don't want to hear about it. And they, it's just like, but I don't know. Well, I think it's just it, it's it's interesting because it, look, look how like um just like the depth like the the meaning of the rainbow even yeah like that's so interesting how like you can't like it, how a like a minority group of people have been able to take the entire color spectrum and make that represent pride right and how that the original context of the rainbow has been taken and like it's kind of the opposite of peace and that's it's creates a lot of turmoil and it creates a lot of you know separation which is really interesting well the rainbow their idea with the rainbow was the idea that it's a diverse crowd it, it represents diversity you know all these sure. different colors represents the, the confluence and the acceptance of people from all different backgrounds that was the idea behind lbgtq taking the rainbow as it's as its sign but it, it, it is interesting that it's it's becoming a sign of uh, you know what whenever people don't recognize it or celebrate it it becomes a, it becomes a, a, a sign of judgment you know i mean yeah. look at 
baseball players that took all of that uh, pain for not wanting to, you know, wear, wear, wear it, you know? So now if you don't, if you don't wear it, then, you know, you face judgment, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Rainbow is not supposed to be judgmental. It's supposed to be a sign of peace and remembrance. Yeah. It's, it's literally the, everything that we believe in is the world has made the exact opposite. Well, yeah. cause it's, I mean, cause Satan rules the world. So I honestly stopped using rainbows. Like I did, like, I don't know if it was subconscious or conscious choice or whatever, but like, I really don't, didn't like as an emoji or like art or anything. Cause I didn't want people to get the idea, <laughs> like legitimately that I was supporting that. Yeah. I mean, I think any, any political sign is like that, you know, it's not that you're against, you know, a rainbow in any way. It's just that you, you, any, any political sign that's used in any way uh, that would be, um, a leverage in politically is something you wouldn't want to use because you certainly yeah, yeah. present a particular point of view or politics. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's why I love these studies so much because now I feel like I can reclaim the power of the rainbow. Like, right? Well, like, I really did not realize. I mean, like, I knew what the rainbow represented before, but not like in the way of like, hey. The, I love the rainbow and this is why because it represents peace and remembrance well it's also cool because he presented it in the clouds and the cloud yeah. was all the people were, whenever people saw God he was always in the cloud so yeah. the, when God connected the rainbow to the cloud he did that as a as a way to say to him hey you know even though I'm in the cloud of concealed whenever you see the bow in the cloud remember it's peace and remembrance so is it and it, it says it's a covenant so it is the rainbow actually is a symbol of Jesus Christ. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, which kind of takes away the whole global warming argument too, because we know that the world's never going to be flooded again. So how can it be flooded if we know it's Why? not? Yeah, that's so interesting that that is the biggest argument of global warming is that the whole Earth is going to be flooded. Yeah, yeah. Well, God said it'll never be flooded again, so that's why people ask me about it. I say, well, well, in fact, we know that the Earth is not going to destroy itself. Yeah, God's gonna uh, bring bring to the end of the planet, not not not. Yeah. and then people think you're crazy when you say something yeah, like that. Yeah, I mean, global warming's not gonna destroy it. Christ is. Well, the whole point is because that's all arrogant that there is no God controlling anything. But God's not gonna let man destroy the planet. There's too much wrath being built up for judgment. God's gonna get that special role. He's not gonna let anything happen to the planet. Yeah. You know what I think is really interesting too about rainbows is when we ever used to draw rainbows, remember you saw always draw a rainbow, but it always sat on two little tiny clouds. Now yeah. you just draw, people just draw the rainbow without the clouds anymore, which I thought was interesting because all the original rainbows that we would love would always be on the two clouds. Well, the rainbow, the whole point of the rainbow is connected. The original story is connected to clouds, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah, the rainbow in the emoji. It's not connected is, to clouds has anymore. No clouds. I didn't think that's interesting. I thought that was really interesting how they took the clouds away from the rainbow. Yeah. So, well, you know, and now you see how you know. You notice you, that? You that's see crazy. The huh? diversity of how I'm clouds sorry. work in these in these passages. Yeah. And the only time that a cloud, uh, you know, the only time that a cloud is really connected to anything that's really exciting is when it's connected to the rainbow and as a sign of peace i just found that so is it every time we see a rainbow that it like is god's coming wow what about even seeing a rainbow in the reflection of water because you get the color spectrum like say like you get a reflection from the side there's maybe no clouds but like you ever notice that like in the rainbows you can see that spectrum yeah I don't know. I considered a rainbow, though. I guess it's just more of. I guess that's what a rainbow is just the reflection of the water and the rain and the clouds, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I guess I, I'm going to be a lot more attentive now when I see rainbows and thunder, listening to thunder. Hey, God may be talking to us and we have no idea, huh? <laughs> I kind of feel bad because there was a storm the other day and there was a bunch of lightning and thunder and we were sitting out on the balcony watching it and I told Asa that it was just God farting. <laughs> You said that? <laughs> and I was like, no, no, no. Do not tell Asa that it's God <laughs> farting. <laughs> so, oh, that's, that's an amazing theological interpretation. <laughs> Straight blasphemy. I blasphemed. God doesn't have gas, girl. <laughs> God doesn't have gut issues. What you talking about? <laughs> that's funny. 
Wow. So anyway, um, you can Garrett, stop the recording. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll cut that part. <laughs> stop the recording. <laughs> Garrett's, Garrett's visiting. We'll edit this recording, so this whole last conversation will be uh, edited. <laughs> that's so funny. All right. So, well, that was awesome. Well, that's it for tonight. Can What's you that? stop the recording? Yeah, I'll stop it. <laughs> uh, go ahead and go ahead and pray. Go ahead, close it in prayer, one of you. Okay, Ty. Okay. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for giving us this message today to really understand the meaning of your glory and your majesty and allowing to open our hearts and open our eyes to the truth. Um, thank you so much for using Ralph as an instrument um, to be able to handle your word accurately and be able to teach us and disciple us through, um, through this reality that we go through together um, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, Bless us this week as we go through. Allow us the opportunity to be an instrument for you to be able to lead more people to your son, Christ. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen.